On July 4th, 1776, our founding fathers signed the Declaration of Independence. We know this day as the very first Independence Day. It is now an American holiday associated with food, fun, family, and fireworks. Lots of fireworks. It's a day when we celebrate what's important. It's a day when we celebrate this nation's freedom. It is also a chance for us to focus on another freedom that we have. A freedom given to us not by our founding fathers, but by our Heavenly Father. So as we take time to celebrate our nation's independence and freedom, let's also pause and thank God for our spiritual freedom from sin, shame, and fear. A freedom that has been made possible by Jesus. Thank you for joining us in our virtual church service. We're excited to have you join us this morning. One of our favorite ways to tune in is on our back patio. So feel free to tune in in the way that suits you best in the comfort of your home. First, we'll be starting with the children's story. And then we'll be going on to worship. And we are still continuing with the Unstoppable series. Feel free to connect with us with the virtual online connection card. We'd love to connect with you and support you in any way that we can. We will also be taking an offer in one way. You can do that is... Push pay. Push pay. <laughs> Thanks for joining us and we hope you enjoy the service. God bless. Good morning, boys and girls. Happy Sabbath. This week, I want to talk to you about a story that I read. And boys and girls, if you ever want to read stories that are full of action and adventure and like maybe a little bit of mystery, guys, you have to read your Bible. It is filled with so many good stories. And even me as an adult, as I go back and I read some of these stories that I've read from when I was a kid, I am still learning quite a bit. So even if you've read the story before, go back and spend time reading the stories from the Bible this week. This week, I have been reading the story about Joshua. Now, in the book of Joshua, even from like chapter one, it starts with like, bam, adventure. You're gonna love it. I have been reading in particular this week, I've been reading a lot about chapter five through chapter seven. Now, I learned about a man whose name was Achan. Now, I don't know if I'm saying it right, but can you say that with me? Achan. Now, we're gonna find about what happened with him and what can we learn from him. So, boys and girls, the Israelites had just defeated the city of Jericho and God had done like major, major miracles. He did some awesome things and I don't even wanna tell you because I want you to go find out for yourself, but think rushing water, freezing time, uh, rededication, uh, food falling from heaven, replaced with wonderful nourishment from the land, um, trumpets blaring, walls falling down, amazing things happen, okay? So they had just taken over the city of Jericho in an amazing way, and the Lord said, listen, I'm going to work for you guys, I'm going to fight for you, but here is my rule. You may not take anything from the city of Jericho because I want it just gone. The people in the city have been worshiping idols and the idol that they mostly worship that I learned about this week was a goddess named Ashtaroth. And they said they worshiped her and she was like a moon goddess. So anyways, they had temples dedicated to her and they did like some crazy things as they worshiped her with like human sacrifices and burning of like um, different people and doing all kinds of terrible things over in the temple. And the Lord said, you know what? I don't want any of that mingled with my people. I don't want you associated with that. And I don't want slowly those things to kind of creep in and you guys take over that. So let's just do away with the city. If you find silver or gold, we're gonna take that. And that is going to be as a thank you offering to the Lord. And we're gonna use that in the temple. Everything else, burn it. Do away with it. I don't want you to take anything from there. Well, there was millions of Israelites. You guys, there was a lot of people because there were 12 tribes and out of all of those, there's always one, right? 
and you're gonna see this his name was Aiken as he was going through the town and he saw like things getting um, they were burning things and um, tearing things down he saw something that caught his eye he saw a beautiful cloth uh, the Bible describes it that he said it was like a Babylonian cloth so something not of the Lord right something that wasn't pleasing to God but maybe it had designs of like who knows what anyways he saw this cloth and in his heart he's like oh I have to have it it's beautiful I need that he saw some gold bars this is a chocolate coin that I had this is all I had for my visual but he saw some like big bars of gold he saw like 50 shekels of silver and he said hmm, nobody will notice I can hide this in my cloak and I can take it back to my tent and nobody will even know huh. you know what guys can we do anything in secret no anything that's done in the darkness will be brought to light and God always knows well Aiken silly guy he took these things to his tent and the next time um, the Israelites were gonna go fight another nation that was um, on their land they were the nation of Ai. Isn't that a funny name? They were the nation of Ai, and the people, um, Joshua sent some scouts. He says, go check out that land um, and how many people we need to fight them. And the people started getting a little confident. That's another lesson. And they said, oh, we only need about 3,000 guys, and we can go and we can take that those people over. Well, it did not work that way. They went to go try to attack them and the people saw them coming and they chased them down the steep hill and the Israelites took off running. Joshua was, oh, he was so upset. He's like, what's going on? We just defeated Jericho and now these people are causing our men to run and then other nations are gonna find out and they're gonna come after us. What are we gonna do, Lord? So God said, relax, Joshua. Somebody in the camp has committed and has stolen from me and has disobeyed. Well, come to find out, the Lord said, let's take lots. That means little by little, we're gonna find out. So Joshua made an announcement. Achan probably heard it and he's like, oh, I'm not saying anything. He's not saying it. He wasn't gonna confess his sin. And so they found out, hmm, there's 12 tribes. Which tribe is the person that um, committed the, um, the disobedience or the crime? And still, Achan didn't say anything. And so then it came to find out that it was Judah. We found out that mm, somebody from the tribe of Judah. So then they went through each clan or each family and still Achan wasn't saying anything. Finally, the Lord showed that it was from Achan's family. And finally, he says, um, they, when they found out it was him, Joshua said, do not hide it. Do not hide it. We already know it's you. You might as well confess, you know? And finally, Achan said, Truly, I have sinned against the Lord Israel, the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I did. I saw among all the things that were going to get destroyed, I saw a beautiful cloak, I saw a bar of gold, and I saw 200 shekels of silver, and I coveted them. That means I wanted them in my heart. And so I took them, and I hid them inside, and I dug up a hole underneath my tent, and that's where I hid them. Oh, so sad. So Joshua sent messengers. And they, sure enough, that's where they found the things. Now, boys and girls, do you think that Achan was truly sorry for what he did? I don't think so either. Because he had a chance to come clean and say, hey, this is what I did when he found out the, the announcement was made that somebody had sinned against the Lord. But he waited to the very last little bit and Joshua even had to say, okay, come on, we already know that it's you. What did you do? And finally he confessed. So I, it doesn't sound like he was even sorry. And after everything that God had just done for them and he, all the things that he was gonna promise to bring them to the land that they had been um, waiting for and all the good things that God had planned for him, still Achan was wanting, he wasn't fully trusting in the Lord and he wanted to take something for himself and he stole from God because that stuff was gonna be dedicated to God and he wasn't thankful at all and he didn't have faith in the Lord and wasn't following the commandments. And do you remember what one of the commandments, I think it was the 10th one, do not covet? Now I was talking to Ellie and Olivia and I was saying, girls, why do you think covet is such a big thing? And after talking and thinking about like, hmm, what happens when we covet? Well, we're just thinking about ourselves, right? We're being greedy and when we covet, there's no way we're gonna be thinking about another person and be kind or generous. 
So it leads to problems with relationships and also with not only with relationship with God as with Achan had here, but also with um, other, with our friends, with our family, if we're being coveting, we're being selfish. Um, and also it can just lead to also stealing. He stole from God. He had to think about it. He's like, oh, that's the stuff that I want. And he stole from God. And when we covet, it first starts in the heart and then slowly we start to act on it. And so that is a big thing that God is warning us. And he doesn't want us to um, even even go there and have that attitude or have that in our heart. It says that Achan had that in his heart, that he had it for a long time. And boys and girls this week, I am praying for myself and I want you to join me in prayer that God... Um, reveals to us the sin that we have in our heart and that maybe at times I know that we have all coveted at one time or another that God teaches us to be thankful and have an attitude of gratitude and be thankful and content with the things that I have because I don't want destruction like Achan had to have because later on he was killed and I don't want that to separate me from God or cause that to have a bad um a bad um effect on relationships as with my friends and my family and so it's a big deal and I want God to teach me how to be thankful. One way that you can do that as a family that would be fun is you can make an ad a gratitude game. Check this out. You can make colors and you can decide what each color should mean. For example, I did this one you can use colors, you can use a dice. Um, this one I put red, name a person you are thankful for or if you roll a one, that's what that means. Name a place you are thankful for. Name a food you are thankful for. Name a thing you are thankful for. Name anything of your choice. And my last one was name a memory or experience you are thankful for. Now you can play by maybe getting M&Ms and if you draw that color, then you say the thing that you're thankful for. Or maybe you can have some toys that are different colors and you close your eyes, you draw one and you say that's what you're thankful for. Or you have a dice, you roll it. If I land on a Five, my paper says, name anything of your choice and I can say something that I'm thankful for. So that's a game for us to practice with our family, with our siblings, ways for us to practice to be thankful and that God slowly, if we have a habit, it's like a muscle that we have a habit of always being thankful, always being thankful, then we have um, just a much more enjoyable and so much more joy that we have and we can share with others when we have an attitude of being thankful for everything that God does for us. And I don't wanna have any covetousness in my heart and I know you don't either because we wanna be close to God and we wanna share love and have that um, self-control that's a fruit of the spirit. And I believe that if we practice things like having a thankful heart, that they're gonna have um, wonderful effects in our homes and in our lives and with our faith and a relationship with God. Okay, have a wonderful week, you guys. Talk to you next time. And remember, go check out the book of Joshua. Bye-bye. When the darkness tries to roll over my bones, when the sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and the pain is all I know Oh, I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance
church let's pray together father in heaven we thank you so much for your love for us thank you for this great day we pray that as we celebrate this uh, wonderful day of independence that your spirit would be with us be with our families and may we remember lord more than anything else why we are who we are as a country and the blessings that you have given us we ask this in jesus name amen well happy fourth of july church this is the day we celebrate the birth of our great nation. Um, I do want to give a little disclaimer here at the beginning. I have uh, been struggling with some back issues, and I'm actually sitting down, and you're going to see me pretty stabilized. Uh, the film crew has done a great job in trying to just kind of zoom in on me, so you're going to see a lot of my face more than maybe some of you would like to. But they are going to be really good about making sure that I uh, am zoomed in on and uh, and so if you see me kind of staying in one place, which is not normal for me, it is because of that. And so I just wanted you to be aware of that. But I'm excited. And I'm really thankful for our film crew. Uh, arguably, as we celebrate the 4th of July, the most famous line in the Declaration of Independence is the second sentence of the preamble, which begins like this. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the meaning was that no one should be denied the right to liberty, to life, and to the pursuit of happiness. Our forefathers append these words as they considered how our nation, this great nation that we get to enjoy right now, because of all the hard work that our forefathers did, our nation could be different from the tyrannical nature of empires and nations before. In fact, our story this morning begins with the act of one of those proud, dysfunctional, evil kings. And his name was Herod. And he reigned under the authority of one of the most oppressive empires in history. His motto was death, imprisonment, and the pleasure of Rome. Totally different. Let's look, this, let's look at this story as we continue in our journey to the book of Acts of the Unstoppable Church. We're going to look at Acts chapter 12. I'm going to be reading verses 1, 2, and 3 right now. And it goes like this. It was about this time. I want you to think about the words this time. Because there's something about God's time. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. And when he saw that this met with approval from among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. This one little line is really important that I want to kind of concentrate on. He said, when he saw that he met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. Almost as if he's saying, oh good, this pleased them. I want to please them. I wonder how many mistakes we have made in order to please others. I want to say today, let's be careful what we do to win the approval of others. These events occurred about 12 years after the crucifixion of the and the resurrection of Jesus. And the church had been growing. It had been expanding during these 12 years. They had been exploding, spreading out to Judea and Samaria. And the beginning to reach the Gentiles. I mean, this was an amazing time for the church. God was unleashing the disciples. God was unleashing these believers to do this great work. But the enemy now strikes a hard blow and moves Herod to king 
the king to take James, the brother of John, and to behead him with the sword. And if I was to set up a screenplay, I would start the movie with this beheading. The movie begins with James being executed for his beliefs, and Peter is captured, and all seems to be lost. The kingdom of darkness appears to have struck a devastating blow, and in jail, Peter sits. And I'm sure he must remember his master's words that said, if you will follow me, make sure you count the cost. Blessed are you when people persecute you, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Now chapter 12, verse 4 and 5 go like this. After arresting him, Peter, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by Four squads or four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison. But the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Did you catch that? This is going to be important a little later. The church was earnestly praying to God for him. This is so big. This word but is that hinge moment. He's in church, but the church is praying. He's in, in prison, but the church is praying for him. He's alone, but the church is praying for him. He feels maybe even a little hopeless, but the church is praying for him, is what the Bible says. Now, it said that, that he was outnumbered 16 to 1. <laughs> These soldiers uh, were all around them. There was increased security because Peter's, this is Peter's third arrest. He had been arrested before. I remember playing Monopoly with my brothers and my oldest brother, Claudio. I don't know how he did it. He did it so that we could never see. But he had this unending supply of get-out-of-jail cards, get-out-of-jail-free cards. I don't know how he did it, but somehow he was able to, to take it and and, and, and we, we never knew how he got it, but there he was. Whenever he got the job, I got it, I got a card, I got a card. Well, Peter was in the habit of getting out of jail. He had this get out of jail free card all the time. Now the Bible continues with verse 6 through 10, and it says this, The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping. I don't know how he's sleeping, to be honest with you. I'd be struggling to sleep. But that night, Peter's at peace. He is sleeping. He is sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains. And sentries stood guard at the entrance. This is a pretty hopeless situation. But the Bible says, as the church is praying for Peter, that suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared. And a light shone in the cell, and he struck Peter on the side, and he woke him up. Quick, get up, he said. And the chains fell off Peter's wrist. I love this. And then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. I wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea. He had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought, the Bible tells us, Luke tells us that he thought he was seeing a vision, just like he did in Joppa. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gates leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left them. Now, I, 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 I'm wondering about this. All of a sudden, this angel appears, and none of the guards see it. None of the guards experience this. Peter does. It's almost as if he says he's in the dream. You've got to love this moment of life, liberty, and the pursuit of freedom at this moment. It was this modern-day prison break. Into the scene comes an angel of the Lord with a light from heaven. 
the angel kicks Peter in the side, wakes him up, and starts issuing preemptory commands. Get up. Get dressed. Put on your shoes. Put on your coat. Follow me. The text gives no suggestion at all that the angel was silent. In fact, he maybe was even yelling, hurry up. He didn't speak in a whisper. That's not what the Bible says. Why did the guards not notice him? What was going on here that was so miraculously? And Peter, it says, he was in a daze. He thinks it's another vision. He is not in control. God, I believe, loved Peter so much. Peter, who is impulsive. Peter, who is stubborn. Peter, who likes to be in control. But God loves Peter so much that in this moment, he will not allow Peter to mess up his own deliverance. And so he kind of puts Peter in a stupor. So Peter doesn't even know what's going on. And he gets to his feet and the chains fall off. He passes out of the cell through the prison, past the other guards. He comes to the iron gate. The gates open and close by themselves. I mean, what is going on here? The angel leads Peter down a side street. And then the Bible says the angel just disappears. And there is Peter. Like, what just happened? Now, here's what I believe. I believe this was not an escape. This was the Lord delivering Peter. That's a whole different thing, isn't it? So the central theme of the book of Acts that we have been emphasizing over and over again, and I don't want you to miss this, is that God's kingdom is here and good luck trying to stop it. All through the book of Acts, nature can't stop it. Government can't stop it. Lock and chains can't stop it. Even death can't stop it. Because the church, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, is unstoppable no matter what. God's relentless mission to save the world is unbelievable. I love this about God. I love the fact that I can be part of a movement that once it gets going, it will not stop. Part of a movement that when God begins the good work in me, he will complete it until the end. That is all part of this momentum that God has for our lives. Not only for us collectively as a church as we spread the good news, but also in our own personal lives. Sometimes we lack faith that God can finish the work that he has started in us, but he will. That is the promise that we have. Now, verse 11 through 15, the Bible says, verse 11 says this, Then Peter came to himself. Finally, it's like he gets, gets awakened, he wakes up. And he said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent these angels and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. Now I know, now that I'm out here and I can think clearly, I thought it was a dream. I wasn't sure what was going on. I thought I was sleeping. But now that I'm out here and I could smell the fresh Jerusalem air, when I could fresh all, I, mean, I could smell what's going on, I could see all the things that are happening around me, I know this is real. And then it says, when this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary the mother of John, also called Mark. This is going to be important in a couple of chapters. But this is John Mark. John Mark is a young man, and he is passionate for Jesus Christ. And apparently this woman, Mary, was a believer. And she had all of these believers. She must have had a huge house. Because she has all these believers at her house, and they're all praying. And it says that, that he went there and where many people had gathered and were praying. Remember, what were they praying for? Who were they praying for? They were praying for Peter. Now, this is important to understand. Because here's where it gets really interesting. Verse 13 says, Peter knocked at the outer entrance and a servant named Rhoda. A servant 
name Rhoda, a servant, came to answer the door. And when she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. I imagine this, Peter is there knocking, knocking, knocking. Here comes Rhoda. She looks through whatever she's looking through. Peter says, hey, it's me. Open the door. Rhoda is so excited. She's like, oh, I can't believe this. And she leaves him out there and goes back. And she says, when she, it says, when she recognized Peter's voice, she was overjoyed. She ran back without opening and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. Now catch what's happening here for a moment. You are out of your mind, they told her. And when she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. Now, I don't know about you, but this is odd to me. I mean, the church was so busy praying, number one, that they didn't even hear the loud knocking at the door. Sometimes we are so focused on the act of praying and the act of being spiritual that we miss God in action. I mean, I'm not against prayer and I'm not against time with God and devotion, but if, we, if that is actually distracting us from experiencing God in action, something is wrong. Rhoda. You know, Rhoda, Rhoda is like this, one of those hidden heroes of the Bible. We see them all throughout the Old Testament. Some of them have names, some of them have not. But these are the people that, that somehow God inspires to say, hey, you go, you do this. And she somehow is able to disengage from the prayer meeting and because she hears the knock and she goes to the door and she sees Peter and she comes back and she's excited. And all they could say to her is what? You are out of your mind. All praying for Peter, and it doesn't occur to them that quite possibly God actually answered their prayers. If, it, if I come and tell you that what you have been praying for is about, what you've been praying for about all this time is actually at the door and then you tell me I'm crazy. I'm wondering which one of us really is crazy. I mean, you've been praying for this. Well, why would you not believe it? In fact, they are so incredulous that at one point they actually say, well, well, well we know Rhoda doesn't lie, so it must be an angel. There's no way that it could be Peter. I mean, goodness, we've been praying for this, but really, I mean, could this really be it? I, I, I don't know. Some of us are so faith deficient that we will reason away the clear answer to prayer. We let our brains interfere with recognizing God's obvious miracle. You do know that God loves to give impossibility and inferiority complex. You do know that God is bigger than the obvious. You do know that God loves to, 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 to do stuff that, that is just so amazing that, that you would just sit there and go, this is a miracle. That's what God does. And so if we are praying for this and it happens, we should not be astonished. But that's exactly what it says. Because look what it says in verse 16 and 17. It says, but Peter kept on knocking. I'm glad that he did. Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Why? See, I'm always amazed at this. I mean, yes, yes, we were praying, but we didn't really think this was going to happen. And if I pray for healing for somebody, and that healing happens, I celebrate. But I'm not going to be astonished because that's what God does. That's the business that he is in. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet. Now, I've been knocking out here. You guys are making all this noise. I just, I just escaped. I just got delivered. Let me come in and tell you the story. Tells them to be quiet and describes how the Lord brought him out of the prison. And, tell, and then he says, tell James 
and the other brothers and sisters about this. And he said, and then he left for another place. Which means what? It means that he actually had gone there to the people that were praying for him just to let them know that their prayers were being answered. That's it. He wasn't going there to hide. He was going there to say, hey, look, hey, look, God has answered your prayers. I got to go somewhere else. Let James know everything is cool. And this is not James, the brother of John. This is the other James of the apostles, who's, by the way, elected their top leader, as we will see next week. Verse 18 and 19 say, In the morning there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. <laughs> what happened? He was chained to you. <laughs> Wasn't he chained to you? I mean, come on. And after Herod had a thorough search made for him and did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. Because that's who Herod was. In fact, the chapter ends with Herod thinking that he was so good that he was a god. The Bible says that an angel comes and strikes him. And he dies being eaten by worms. Sooner or later, it comes back. And the narrative ends with these words. I love this. But the word of God continued to spread and flourish. Did you catch that? But the word of God continued to spread and and flourish. But the word of God continued to spread and flourish. Wow. Why? Because the church is unstoppable. When the church is guided by the Holy Spirit, it cannot be stopped. Now I want to address one last thing before we end here. And it says this, that the chapter begins with this very somber, sad way, this tragic execution of James. Remember how the movie starts? He's the brother of John. He's one of the sons of thunder. He's one of the three that Jesus took with him everywhere. Now here's a question I have for you. Didn't Christ's followers love James like they loved Peter? Didn't they pray for James like they prayed for Peter? Why wasn't he saved? Why was Peter saved? I mean, doesn't that kind of strike you a little odd? Or maybe, maybe they didn't pray hard enough. Or maybe some of them did not have enough faith. Or maybe some of them had unconfessed sins. Or maybe somebody in the midst was not authentic enough. As if God is waiting for that, us to be perfect in order to answer our prayers. God answers our prayers not because of who we are, but because of who he is. Peter's deliverance from prison was definitely remarkable. And he lived to die another day. James' work was done. And I believe it was time. I'm not going to lie to you. Sometimes I wish I knew and understood God's timing. I believe it to be a perfect timing. I don't fully understand it. In fact, sometimes his syncopation and his, 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 the way he, he plays that timing is so unbelievable that I, don't, I, I can never understand it. Sometimes I'm glad I don't. But here's what I know. He knows what I don't. And I, well, I don't. He knows. I don't. Sometimes you have to come to the point to recognize this, this, this very simple yet profound truth. He knows. I don't. 
And we've got to come to the point where we exercise our faith, this, this new muscle, this new, this new sense, this sixth sense that's been dormant, exercise it so much that we get to the point where we trust that God is sovereign. When your prayers are answered swiftly and he is sovereign when they aren't. That God rules, that he knows, that he is sovereign through every stormy trial. He is sovereign when you suffer an injustice and when you must walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He is sovereign and he knows what to do. And at the end of the day, one day, James and Peter will see each other in heaven. And it was as if it was like this. As a child, I believe, as children, we are invincible until God's perfect timing and will for our lives is fulfilled. And so I leave you with this thought. Think about it. It's going to be simple, but think it through. He knows. I don't, but I trust him. Pray with me. Father in, in heaven, Lord, I don't. Don't pretend to always understand, and I don't even pretend to always like it. I know there are times when I question, why, Lord, why? But the more I practice trusting you, the easier it is to trust you. The easier it is to be like Peter, or even to get to the point where I can sleep in prison awaiting what my destiny is. And I trust you, Lord. I trust that you will keep me and that you who have begun this good work in me will finish it until the day. I pray these things not only for me, but for all those who hear this message. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, church. We'll see you next week. God bless.